Yeah, this is one telling it all. It's very simple, actually. Never mind. Um, I will start by... I met at a conference in Edinburgh, Ken Warpole, who is an architectural critic, and he told me something which made an enormous impression on me. He held up a bottle and said, or some object, and said, it's a bad, bad luck of you architects that your mean of communication to each other is a still photo and the two-dimensional drawing. Because by doing the communication in that way, you constantly focus on the form because that's the one you can communicate. But this, this is sculpture. This is not architecture. Architecture is the interaction between life and form. And only if that works well is it good architecture. And now comes the point that, that it's so easy to study this and to make research about this it is considerably more complicated to make research about this and even more complicated to find out about the interaction, what works and what doesn't. However, the form has an immense influence on the quality of life for those here. It has been my privilege through so soon 50 years to be crawling down here and trying to find out what this is. And when I talk about research today, I don't talk about technocratic research, but I talk about research into the soft issues, which has tremendous importance for us as architects. The interaction here. And I will, I have put in, oops, how do you change this? How we can do it here. Um, I have put in some, There we are. Next, sorry about that. I put in some pauses here, here and there. Um, I had some uh, remarks which I couldn't find time for in the flow of the thing, so I'll fire them off now. Uh, having worked in the borderland between architecture, sociology, and psychology, and uh, done research over many, many years, I've had many sessions with people from universities. And they will invariably say that it's so interesting with you architects because um, it's not really a profession. In a profession, they give 10 pills to 10 patients here and 10 non-pills to 10 other patients here. And then they check after 10 years how many died. Then they find out now we have a better pill. So they test and research and improve their product. That's a profession. You architects, you build a building, take two photos and rush off to the next one. Never bother to go back to the previous one. And if you hear bad rumors, you say, oh, I'm, I'm far away from that now. Um, another thing which these people will say that is that um, in universities or in a number of the other professions, based on enormous amounts of evidence, the most limited conclusions are drawn. Not so with you architects. Based on the most limited information, the most wide-ranging conclusions are drawn. Also, again, a third one saying, you architects, in the first three hours, you have the solution coming out of your, of your shell or sleeve, and then you use the next three weeks to have to rationalize that it was a good solution. That was some of the guys. And that, of course, is about the university professions and, and the university situation and the art school situation. Or the, I come from an academy of fine arts. It's one of the worst in the world, the, the academies of fine arts. But let's now move on. I, that was a little bit of a start. And I will concentrate on the soft issues in research. I'll tell you very shortly the story of my life. Um, it's it's a, lo a long period, but, but I do it very shortly. Uh, I graduated in 1960. I was trained as a good modernist. We were hanging over the models and we were taught that if it looked good from the freeway, it would be good residential areas. I rushed out from university 
there was a boom on and we were going to build a lot and I, as the other ones, were going to do this wonderful stuff which Corbusy had learned us to do. Well, then, then I uh, married a psychologist. And, uh, and then there was a beginning of, a long, of long discussions between the various professions I came from, she came from, some of her friends, whatever. It was a very fertile period in the 60s where the universities opened up and we started to bridge break out of our, our ivory towers. I had to go back to university. I spent 40 more years there to find out what was wrong with my education. That was not, not little. And I wrote a number of books. Uh, it took me 40 years to get rid of the education and sort of find out some of these things. I did this little thesis book called Life Between Buildings. I did it 42 years ago. It is still very much alive. It's the, the most recent came yesterday. That was a Greek edition. And I said to the Greeks, don't waste your money by, by publishing my books. And they say, oh no, don't worry, Mr. Gill. We got all the money from the Danish embassy. <laughs> so that's fine. You can see here how over the years it's been revised many times. You can also see that it starts out with hippies sitting in the street in Denmark, then it gets more provincial, there's some uh, uh, street happening, and it ends to be very global and neutral and used far away places. I'm very proud that this, I'm very humbly surprised that this book is now used in developing countries and in countries all over the world. And if these humanistic thoughts can be a, of help, for the development of these countries which have so many problems, I, of course, am very happy. I'm also extremely happy that every book I ever wrote is published in China. And I know they are widely distributed because I've signed them all, <laughs> 25,000. The problem out there is they've never had time to read them. But maybe given time, maybe we never know. Anyway, um, at some point in my life, actually, when I was 63, there were so many people who said, you have made so much theory and have so many criticisms of architecture and planning. Couldn't you come and show us what we shall do? It was especially cities. And then I formed the company together with Helle Søholdt. And we said, if you want livable cities, we can help you. And in just 13 years, it has just exploded. There is a fantastic interest in a more soft approach to architecture and planning all over the world. And we have worked from one end of the world to the other. And there comes the research and the practice into it. I will, I will deal with this now uh, to some extent. OK. Then, a couple of years ago, I wrote another book called Cities for People. And it was the same stinking rich Danish foundation who came and said, couldn't you write down everything you know while you can still remember it? <laughs> so I did write all this down um, because they gave me some, mem some money to help my memory. <laughs> that means to have assistance to do research and things like that. And we made the book which is now completely exploding and it's out in more than 20 languages. And yesterday, we signed the contract for Kazakhstan. Um, it's even out in French, which I'm very proud of. After 40 years, we have a book in French. It's not in France, of course, but it's in Quebec, <laughs> Montreal. And so this book actually is about all we now know about this. And then they came back to me this year, or last year, saying, couldn't you write another book while you can still remember and tell how did you develop the message? How did you find out about this? And then we have to do a new book, which is brand new, which is called How to Study Public Life, um, which, which is, I'll show you later on, whatever. I'll come back to that. That's for me to have a little. <laughs> this Cities for People, it deals very much with the change of paradigm. And I can see now, it's always a privilege 50 years later to write a book. 
I can see now that around 1960 there was a fantastic change. There was the biggest change in the history of mankind. That was the introduction of the modernistic way of thinking. We should have a new architecture, we should have new site plans, we should have new city plans. Everything should be, everything known should be thrown out because now modern man should have modern environments. Fantastic. The other part of the change of, of paradigm around this time was the introduction of, of cheap cars and cheap petroleum, which, which had a, have had in the past 50 years a fantastic influence. Um, first, all the cars went and filled all the existing spaces. Um, yeah, maybe I should go, no, we can. Okay, already at that time, 61, Jane Jacobs wrote down, hey, 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 if the modernists and the motorists are going to form our future, the cities will be dead. Look out of your window to Houston, to, um, Houston Street in, in, um, in, in, in Greenwich Village and see what real life is. And these guys, they don't know a shit about it. And she wrote about this. It had a great influence as an ideological book. She was a journalist. Um, Okay, these changes of paradigm, the, f the, the one with the motor uh, car, the invasion, all the cities were full, and then we had a completely new infrastructure based on cheap petroleum. And gradually, we also had a fantastic competent group of people, the traffic engineers, they, had a, they have a heyday and still have. And they are very well trained universities, and they are out there organizing the potholes while people are generally world, uh, around the world having a worse and worse time. So the, then we can talk about the, the research in these areas. I think that the traffic engineers, they have, pr they have fantastic research. They know everything. They count everything. They have models and they have prognosis of everything and, and so they have a very, very impressive and I admire them mightily because they know so much and by knowing so much they influence so much. And then when we come to the soft values in city planning, do you know of anybody who has a city department for pedestrians and public life? Yeah, Tina Sobi has now. And do you know cities who, who know as much as the traffic engineers know about the people? No. Some, people, some cities have started now, but it's been a fantastic gap between what we knew about traffic and we knew about people. Nobody looked after it. And we also found out that if we know through research about a subject, then it is being discussed and you can have a policy and it has influence on what happens. So if we have areas where no knowledge is available, it will generally be overlooked and everybody would talk about it nicely. The other change of paradigm, I have to go very fast, that was the introduction of the modernistic thinking, the, the, um, um, the ideas from 1930, cities were bad, freestanding buildings were good. Um, what happened was that we were at that point had to build very fast and very large, and the modernistic ideas was very easy to reproduce and to do in big scale. So the planners stepped up and started to organize the objects from a great height. The site planners also went up and started to organize the thing. And nobody thought about that there was a hard need to have somebody to look after where people were. That was always looked after in the history of mankind. Now there was nobody looking after it. And then I call it the Brasilia syndrome, where everything is done from above and from a distance. Uh, and Brasilia looks like an eagle, and the buildings are very tooted. And we hear a lot about Brasilia. When I was studying, we were sort of lying face towards Brasilia daily. Um, so fantastic. Down at eye level, Brasilia is absolutely shit. Nobody thought that they didn't have an helicopters, all of them, so they can enjoy the city. What has happened is that we are still doing Brasilia syndrome planning based on the modernistic uh, idea of freestanding buildings on grass. We are doing it all over the world. Uh, this is just one example. We also, and I'll come back to that, we started to have a new 
breed of architects, which are the bird sheet architects who go around and drop buildings wherever they can be paid, um, not always looking much into the context. Um, so we have a globalization of the profession of architects going together with these very simple planning ideas. Here you can see the usual suspects hanging over the model, and you can see the model here. You can hear them say, we have no oval buildings. Oh, for God's sake, let's have two oval buildings. And couldn't we tilt those 45 degrees? Yes, we can tilt them. And then you have a, a, a Dutch a new town. How is it for the Dutch at eye level? And the confusion is complete. Now this is a very charming new Chinese city. Have a good time in Hefei Binhu. If, if we talk about research in relation to the modernistic planning principles, I should say that when all this started, nothing was known. It was not realized that physical form had anything to do with quality of life and, and a number of social and soft issues. It was known, and we have research on health and fire brigade. And if you look at the rules, they are very much influenced by, by sun, air, and contact with nature, and good fire escapes and running water and uh, things like that, physiology and safety. But sociology and psychology, nothing was known. It was not realized that by putting all these buildings out with great uh, intervals and having, instead of spaces, you have in-betweens, in be and, and this could not be used for human encounters. So virtually, for years and years and years, the modernistic planning went unchallenged and unresearched. It is evidence, of course, that people generally throughout the period never liked this way of planning. And there is much, much evidence about this. Um, here, the Australians, they are more specific. <laughs> and here, they have started to realize something may be wrong in this way of planning. And I like this one. I saw it this spring in, in, in Melbourne, that now we fix your salads. Next up, we must fix the dock lanes. You could also have a sign like this on your salad bars here in London. And that's, again, these modernistic planning areas, they were never popular with the ordinary people, um, whatever. So very little research in this area. Fantastic manipulation. Nobody checked it. And where is the architects in all this? I think that the architects, they have been utterly confused, uh, generally. Um, and also, we've had the globalization, and we've seen an increasing focus on form, that architects are now competing on form increasingly. It's, I wouldn't say it started with the Opera House, but that was a fantastic uh, feat in 57 uh, of a building which made a whole country actually. But then it, it went on and on and, and anything goes and um, this fixation on form and you can brand the city by having another Guggenheim and then you can build something which is more turned or more funny than the other guy or higher or look like a palm leaf, or is the highest in the world. It is, it is form and, and the quantity, the longest, the biggest, the highest. And going up and down in Dubai, I think it looks like a perfume shop, uh, all the buildings there. I think they're made in the same way. They're made to look different from the other ones. Um, the contents may be slightly different, but what is really important with high-rise buildings is, of course, how they land and what they form of kind of city. But that has just clearly not been the object here. It's about to have a funny form which will uh, catch the eye. Can it be worse? Yes, this is no modern Tate. They, they talk about modern city planning. Here we are. Can it be still worse? Yes, this is Frank Geary, a new housing area in, a new housing area in Brooklyn. 
Do we have any evidence that people are more happy and the cities function better with this kind of architecture and this kind of form fixation? We actually have no evidence. There has been, from time to time in these 50 years, some attempts to, to address the situation. Uh, of course, some of the worst were dynamited, and we had a number of movements like the um, reconstruction of European cities. We have the, the um, new urbanism in America. We have in Scandinavia a very strong uh, environmental, uh, dense low uh, movement where much emphasis was put on the quality of life. And also, I think that all this has to do with this quest for the good old days and the Princess Foundation has been uh, very much eager to the good old days thing. Um, so we were worried about the, the rapid development of our cities and we thought back to the good old days in various ways in various countries. That's been one of the movements, not based on, on research, but more based on, 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 on gut feelings. Does architects not like people on planners? Don't, don't they like people at all? No, they love people because every time there is a project, it's crawling with happy people. Whether it's a good project or it's a bad project, it's absolutely crawling with people and they have a bloody good time doing things no people would ever do in cities. Here is the waterfront in Sydney. They are all there. All the Sydney siders are here for one lunchtime here. This is a social housing in Denmark. Fantastic, fantastic. Must be a good project. So, <laughs> architects and planners, they love people, and they love them on the perspective drawings, and they know that if they can make people believe that this works, then people know that it's a good project, and they get more happy. So you can always draw this, and then you find that it doesn't work after all, because it may more likely be like this down in, on the ground level or like this in the lovely bench by Graham Kohlhaas, by the way. Um, so there is not much concern and there is not much knowledge. Um, I'll go very quickly over this. This is the most popular area in Copenhagen, the highest prices. Some old workers' cottages, two and a half story, looks awful from the air, looks awful from the helicopter. Down at eye level, it has all the qualities you could ever talk about, and it has the highest concentration of architects in Denmark. And the planner, planning head of planning in Copenhagen lives there, the prime minister, you name them, half the professors from school, they live there. And this is sort of practical research that they show with their feet where it's good to live and the prices are sky high and it looks awful from the air. So my, my conclusion here is that uh, of course the people scale is the most important and we haven't studied that much. I mentioned that we've done a new book now about methods for trying to find out more about this and the interaction. It's just come out and we made an overview, you can't see it, but an overview of some of the books which have been written over these 50 years. And also, we, we are not the first, but many people have pointed out that when tuberculosis was a big problem, modernism was invented as an anti-tuberculosis architecture. Long after tuberculosis was beaten, we continued 50 more years to do modernism. Then we had what we call lifestyle diseases or industrialization diseases, and that would be heart and traffic accident, heart disease and anxiety, whatever. And returning to the good old days would sort of be the answer to that. Now we, had, we have the, um, the obesity crisis and whatever, and a new type of city planning would be the answer to that. Uh, architecture have followed with some delay the various concerns for health in society, which is a very interesting um, area to study, by the way. I would say, and I'm happy about that, that after 50 years we now have a change of paradigm. 
it goes from more quantity-oriented to much more quality-oriented issues. We want livable cities, attractive, safe. We need to have sustainable and healthy cities. And I will not go into details about why we like and love li lively and livable cities, why people cities are attractive, why they are more safe, why people cities are more sustainable and also lend themselves to better public transportation and better, better green transportation, and why, green, why these new cities can be much more healthy. We have built for 50 years cities which, which actually had built in unhealthiness for the whole population because they were never asked to move a finger. Um, and that has caused um, obesity and lack of, of activity to be the main cause of death, much worse than the cigarettes. So now we have cities around the world with new agendas. We will, instead of having people so comfortable as possible behind the gasoline um, and the four wheels, rubber wheels in the corner of the each person, we will now make city planning where people are induced to walk and to bicycle as much as possible, not on Sundays and Saturdays, but for God's sake, every day a year. And we know that if you have an hour a day, you can have seven more lives years and you are much cheaper for the health system. Um, I'll take the example of Copenhagen and now also there's an example about how research and practice goes together. Uh, you like that. Um, Copenhagen was one of the very first cities and also it's something about the app. Where have you seen this thoughts of this book, Cities for People, where are they actually applied? And Copenhagen is an example. And Copenhagen, they started out very, very early in 62. And that was the time when Jane Jacob wrote her book in Greenwich Village, Copenhagen pushed the cars out of the main street. Nobody believed it would work, so it worked wonderfully. And over the years, they have improved every single year. They have improved on the conditions for the life in the city. Uh, in this city of Copenhagen. Copenhagen was also the first city in the world where the life in the city was studied. This was studied by us people from the university. Nobody asked us to do it, but we, uh, or maybe rather I, was um, doing this PhD where I sat on the main street to see for a whole year, to see every day what was going on and try to systematize it and published it and after some time, there was a very interesting interplay between city and university, town and gown. We did the surveys, we studied every bit they did, and we counted all the people, and we published it, and we tried to bring order in it, and that was public knowledge, and the city received it and looked into it, and then after a while, the city started to say, we don't know much about this. Would you also go and study that? And after a while also we got money to help us in our studies. And also I know now that I got, when I retired, I got a nice letter from the mayor, uh, or was it the city architect at that point, saying that if you at university had not collected all this information about the life in Copenhagen, we politicians would never have dared to make Copenhagen one of the nicest cities in the world. So that is an example about research, helping city planning, and that's also very much what our new book is about, is this example of research actually being able to lift a city, the city planning. Copenhagen became the first city in the world which have an official plan to be the best city for people in the world. They have an official plan to be the best city for bicycles in the world. They are the first city where the government arrived to the Queen in, on bicycles to get their commissions two years ago. Um, and also, it's number one on the list of livable cities in the world. These things are, in my point of view, connected. Are there other cities who have done something like that? Yeah. city of Melbourne is a miracle. And it is a modern city, wide streets, whatever. It has been very early, they started, they decided it was famous for being dull and unuseless, and they decided that they would 
make it invigorate it and make it a wonderful city, a fantastic city. And they started again to get information, to get evidence about how the city was used and use this, uh, use this uh, offensively in trying to improve the city step by step by step. They made fantastic improvements. And now Melbourne is like Paris and it's a fantastic city. And um, other cities would have done this would be Sydney. He came a little bit later when they heard Melbourne was doing it. Um, and again, in Sydney, they are full speed in throwing out the cars and bringing in the pedestrians and the light rail in the streets, as you should have done in Oxford Street years ago. Um, Sydney has not done so much yet, but they are very, very good in making posters about what they like to do. And I think that's very important that you tell the population that you're doing this for mankind and the climate, and you better start to think about that you shall walk and bicycle much more, and we are doing it for the climate. And then, lo and behold, on the list of most livable cities in the world, 213, Copenhagen, Melbourne, number one and two, and the cities which have, I have worked with and which I know have, have started with this interplay between research and practice of, of, of the 10 first, I know about that six of them are definitely into this of studying, of getting information about the soft issues before they plan. New York had some problems with the bicycles. There was a little poster about it. But New York also had a fantastic, they decided, the mayor, Ken, Ken Bloom, uh, Michael, Michael Bloomberg, he promised to be the most green metropole in the world, the most sustainable metropole, and they are all to bicycle. There should be no commuting cars, and being Americans, they set off with a, with a very good speed, and the, they, they are rolling out bicycle lanes in a tempo you could not imagine, um, not only in Manhattan, but all over the city. And also they realized that they were not sweet to the people, they were very sweet to the motor cars, so they started to identify a number of areas where they could make wonderful public spaces. Broadway, a Times Square was one of the spaces, and that was closed in 2009. And now Broadway looks like this. And it was done as an experiment, but half a year later the mayor came out and said, experiment? No way. It's the biggest success we've had in, in planning in New York in the last hundred years. Finally, we've got the ideas of Jane Jacobs materialized in our own city and can enjoy it. They go on and now they are planning to bring in <laughs> buffaloes and, and have a really relax, relaxed time on Times Square. Um, but that means that the mindset has been completely changed um, I will end this with a little visit to Moscow. Um, Moscow heard about our work in Melbourne, Sydney, Copenhagen, London, and in New York. And then uh, when the president said to Moscow, it's appalling what kind of quality you have, Moscow. Go and bring your act together. Then they came galloping and said, you must come to Moscow. And it was... So we went to Moscow and we made a site like this. Freedom from communism is a right to drive everywhere and park everywhere. And this they do. And, it, and they said, what can we do? And we did what we have done a number of times. We started systematically to find out what are the conditions for people in this city. This is the main street where at some point they realized they had too little parking spaces so they could park on the sidewalk and the whole air is full of advertisements and there's one meter left for people to, to shuffle through Main Street, Moscow. What happened over there? They published all my books and I forced them to read them. <laughs> the, the worried guy out at the corner there is a Danish ambassador. He was not so convinced, but let's see. Then we were hired by the city to do a big public space, public life survey, as we've done in the other cities, as we have developed, and which is described in this new book. And now, one and a half year later, you go down to the main street, no parking, 
all the links on the main street, there are benches. They, they used to be a gray street. Now there are greenery, there are flowers, and there are trees. And all the advertisement has disappeared, and you can see Kremlin at the end of the sidewalk. It's a miracle. And here you see the mayor of Moscow. Who, he's now been brainwashed, and he is on the route to a livable city after all these years. Um, I think, yeah, these are an overview of the cities where we have introduced what we learned in Copenhagen in research. We used Copenhagen as a laboratory. We learned a lot about how you can influence a city by getting more interest in the people, how you can systemize it, systematize it, and how you could turn it into policy which can improve your city. This we have worked over in now in all these cities, London being one of them. Not too much has happened in London compared to the other ones, but maybe they can be inspired by Moscow one day. We are now 50 years after Jane Jacobs. And for many, many years, I think that she, she was read widely, but she didn't have much influence. Um, I have made this little thesis of mine, PhD thesis, 50, 42 years ago, and it, it's still coming out. It's come out in, in 35 editions and 24 languages. The next one will be Icelandic. I'm very proud of that. Not many people make it into Icelandic. But then you could question yourself now after 50 years, what has really happened? And what I can see, where are these soft ideas picked up and used? They are picked up and used in the cities. That's the lower end here. And where do I think there is a fantastic deficit? That's in the new stuff. It's new towns. It could be Docklands here. It could be Docklands Melbourne or Docklands in Sydney. It could be new towns here and there. One is from, from Vienna and some of them here, unfortunately, from Copenhagen. And what I'm saying with this is that why has these soft ideas and the research in soft things been introduced in the cities and used in the cities? One of them is even this summer, Regent Street. Um, that is because we have real people here, we have voters, we have people who press the politicians, who discuss the city quality with the politicians, who demand improvements, and then there is a background for improvements. Why hasn't not much happened in architecture and planning? That is, in my point of view, because we still in our schools of planning and architecture, landscape architecture, are completely stuck in the modernistic way of thinking, and we have turned into this celebrating the form for form's sake. And there is appallingly little research being done in what this means for the people who are to live there. We still flash pictures of these new towns to each other, and I, I've tried several times to make a book about nice new towns, and I found two or maybe two and a half here and there. You have to look very, very careful because most of it went wrong. I think that there is a big deficit in education. People are not part of the education at all, still is not. And the research is only very meager. In the course of making this book about how to study public life, um, we try to make an overview of what has been studied and who has been the pioneer and how many books have been made. This happens to be a bunch of Americans. It's, it's interesting that there are so many Americans because you can't see it over there. But um, it's appalling how few has been interested in this subject of life and interaction in the 50 years. And the what we know now, we know something, but it's appallingly how little we know. And I think that I can quote the mayor of Bogota, Enrique Peñalosa, who said, it's, 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 time, it's, it's thought provoking that we know very much more about a good habitat for mountain gorillas and Siberian tigers than we know about a good urban habitat for homo sapiens. 
So, I think that this world is full of brilliant designers. I admire them and I admire the traffic planners for their research. But we as designers and architects, we desperately want programs which are just as good as the designers. Much good design goes sky way up in the air without having a good foundation. So I do think that the programs are very under evaluated and underdeveloped in our in and in, in our profession. And also I think that that this really is an area which should be developed. In my firm we do absolutely no design. We do strategies, we do programs, we do analysis, uh, and we help to make the foundation and advise the designers where to go instead of of fiddling with the design because so many people are doing excellent design but the programs are the weak spots. So, in conclusion, let us develop a profession where we have research and we have also design and they go together. Thank you.